and I'm Jen Dintel. Uh, this is our panel on Hotwire and women's music. So we're very excited about our panelists today. We've got Tony Armstrong Jr., uh, one of the founders of Hotwire. We have Georgia Harper, who's an author and journalist, a frequent contributor to Hotwire as well. And then we have Dr. Bonnie Morris as well, who's an expert on women's music and lesbian culture, also a contributor to Hotwire. So what, how this panel will work, um, we're just gonna do some brief introductions first, and then I'll start asking a few questions. Tony, could you just start us off and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what Hotwire was and how you were involved in it? Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. Gonna have a good time tonight. Um, it's hard to believe that Hotwire was ran only from 1984 to 94, and yet the legacy of it lives on, and it's still cited and used for research and appears places. The idea of it was to have a magazine that would represent our culture, a separatist magazine that would be by, for, and about women, primarily focused on the lesbian culture, but always feminist and always woman identified some way. So not always lesbian. All the writers, photographers, we found a women printing company, um, women who did everything, everything was, um, was what we did. Um, I was one of the founders, along with Yvonne Zipter, Ann Morris, and Michelle Gautreau, who goes by Itaz Karia today. Um, we had been doing some things before we did Hotwire that was organizing around the National Women's Music Festival, um, music industry type things, writers conference things, and all of us really felt like the time was right in 1984 to take a bigger leap and bring together um, the industry. Up until that point, it had been a lot of individual artists, a lot of individual producers, bookstores, radio shows, whatever was happening, but there wasn't anything that could bring everybody together in one place. So that really was our goal. Um, I was the, one of the founders after the first year, the other three left for various reasons. We went on for another, um, another nine years, so it was 10 total, 30 issues. Georgette was there from the first to the last, um, doing a thousand things. And one of the most remarkable things to me is that it was something that was done by young women, I was only 30, um, young women in their spare time, everybody, everybody had full-time jobs somewhere else, it's something we did in our spare time at night and on the weekends from my basement. And uh, at our peak, we had about 40 volunteers um, I look back at the quality of these things and it was truly, truly remarkable given that we didn't have email, we didn't have until the middle of it, desktop publishing even, let alone the tools you have today. Mm -hmm. Um, and every issue had, uh, four songs in a record. So these are uh, an absolutely in retrospect now priceless and remarkable, uh, collection of, music, some of which is not heard anywhere else. So I'm going to turn it over to Georgette. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Um, well, um, I wasn't a part of Not Just a Stage, the production company that initiated um, Hotwire. Uh, but by the time the first issue of Hotwire came out in November of 84, Tony and I had been lovers for just over a year. So I was privy to all the planning aspects, deciding on the name, and to some of the discussions leading up to the birth of that first issue. And then when Tony and I broke up two years later, I continued to contribute writing articles, uh, and for a while doing copy editing, photography, uh, developing photographs, all sorts of things. Um, Yesterday and the day before, uh, because of this panel, I went to the Hotwire website online and I skimmed my way through all 30 issues, partly because I didn't even remember what I had written <laughs> in Hotwire anymore. It's just so long ago, you know. And I, so I wanted to look it over and uh, remind myself exactly what I had done uh, in the magazine and just to look it over the whole. And I found this so interesting that now I plan to reread each issue carefully 
since I kept finding things that I didn't recall at all that were really great. Uh, for an example, Rosetta Wrights, who did a lot of um, history of women in music articles, she did a story about Ethel Waters that I didn't recall at all. Now, um, a couple of years ago, I put together a slideshow of women in the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, one of the women featured in that was Ethel Waters. And so here I'm reading this uh, Hotwire episode, uh, Hotwire issue that's, what, 30 years old at this point, and learning new stuff about <laughs> Ethel Waters. It, it's great. Um, so it was really a trip down memory lane for me. And there were so many names of women who I hadn't even thought about in years. Just, I wrote down a few. Karen Beth, Faith Nolan, Monica Grant, Marla B.B. Brodsky, Rose, Judy Fiel, Hunter Davis, Nancy Berriano, the publisher. These are uh, women who I haven't thought about in ages, and it was really wonderful to, uh, to uh, remember them and, and uh, do that again. So I, I recommend that anybody who's interested in this definitely go back and, and take a look at these issues. So um, at the time of uh, Hotwire's inception, uh, I was uh, working uh, as a freelance writer. I'd done work in um, a little uh, women's newspaper, lesbian feminist newspaper called, um, uh, called what was it called, Blazing Star. <laughs> and then I started uh, contributing to Gay Life. And uh, just to show you, this is a uh, Gay Press, Gay Power, uh, edited by Tracy Bame. It's a great book. I've got a chapter in here that I wrote about my experiences writing for the gay and lesbian press. Um, and so uh, I was already working in the gay and lesbian press when I started contributing to Hotwire. Um, a year after Hotwire founded, Windy City Times was founded and there was a relationship between Windy City Times and Hotwire. I think uh, Tony used a lot of the Windy City facilities to do typesetting for the magazine and a number of articles that I reported on about women's festivals and concerts and so forth, I was able to expand uh, from Wind City Times and give them more of a specifically lesbian feminist focus and then uh, they would be um, put into Hotwire. So I, I, there's a lot more I could say. I'm not going to go on with this. I just um, I wanted to say that as I was reading through all these issues, it was really nice to see how the masthead went from initially from six women yeah. to by the end of Hotwire's run, the, the print was so small you could barely see the names. There were so many women on that masthead. So, um, and it was nice that the first issue and the last issue were both uh, comedians. Kate Clinton in the first issue and Suzanne Westenhofer in the last one. And I think that shows some of the spirit of what it was like. This, this magazine was a celebration of, uh, there were lots of other magazines where everything was going, oh, poor me, you know, and was, but Hotwire was really a celebration of women's culture and an initiator of women's culture because as the magazine went on, it created more and more of the women's culture that it celebrated. So I'm very proud to have been a part of all of that. So thank you. Thank you. Bonnie, you want to take it from here? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit on a delay here. I apologize for my wonky uh, internet connection. I am sheltering in place deep in the redwoods with my mom. Um, it's a pleasure to see all of your beautiful faces. And I uh, became involved in, uh, with Hotwire in uh, 1990. Um, and um, I had been attending women's music festivals uh, since 1981. I was very familiar with the magazine and I think I submitted my first article before Tony and I ever met formally. Um, and uh, over time, I became a person who um, contributed about nine articles total between 1990 and 1994. But my larger 
hope was to really become a general historian of the culture of women's music and women's music festivals. And um, Hotwire was the vehicle, the text, the Talmud, uh, the <laughs> way that participants in the culture were able to see themselves reflected in artistic review. Um, try not to get too cerebral here. What, what interested me with Hotwire is that I was really aware um, that we were all both the producers and consumers of our own culture. We created the shows and then we watched them and then we reviewed them. We bought it, we sold it, we made it, we kept it, we applauded it, we critiqued it. Um, we popularized it and then we boycotted it, depending on what your mood was. <laughs> and um, I came in as kind of a young thing. I had just finished grad school. Uh, and my friendship with Tony, we usually celebrate on June 23rd, beginning in 1991 at the East Coast Lesbian Festival. And we determined to um, uh, for my more perfect union. I don't even know how much <laughs> homage I can pay to Tony's influence on my life. But three uh -huh. things about that friendship. Uh, she made me a better writer. Tony is a very exacting editor for which I am grateful and I'm sure I kvetch all the time. Um, I was given uh, assignments beyond what I thought would be funky and fun. I started off with some quirky little things about how I almost met Martina Navratilova and why there were so many smart women in the movement and how that could empower um, our vision. Uh, and then I started writing about the importance of documenting the culture. I wrote about my role in facilitating Jewish women's networking at festivals. And then I wrote really about what I ended up doing in a couple of books, the question of the audience. Uh, what was it like for teenagers to go to festivals? What about mothers and daughters at festivals? What about rituals at festivals? Uh, how would you as a fan uh, describe this to uh, women elsewhere? I wrote about taking Hotwire around the world when I worked on Semester at Sea and having listening parties in my cabin. And um, that became a, an article I did that I enjoyed. Um, I did a, a piece uh, where I, very basic where I interviewed Maxine Feldman, but it was a whole lot of different pieces. Um, what was important to me was that the uh, point at which I came into Hotwire was the most uh, prolific time in festival culture. If you mm -hmm. look at festival culture's timeline, I'm fond of pointing out, uh, people love to say it was, uh, you know, pivotal in the 70s and maybe the 80s wrong. Um, if you look at a timeline, the maximum number of festivals was 1989-90. That's when we had all the original ones, plus a bunch of new ones that had popped up like the Gulf Coast Festival, Tam's Jam in Bellingham, uh, in Gaia's Lap, uh, Rhythm Fest, um, East Coast. So there was this critical mass um, where you had all of the original festivals plus the new ones, and between 1989, 90, 91, I was working at something like seven or eight every summer. And um, that came at the midpoint of Hot Wire's run, 84 to 94. Okay, so 89 would have been the middle. And it all seemed to work out beautifully. So um, what interested me was this question of audience. Um, we were extremely uh, aware, self-aware of uh, both uh, the mainstream ignoring what was a culture of incredible talent, and that made us angry and critical of sexism. But we also had something that was just ours, and you had to be in the know. And we had a fan culture that was very benevolent. If you went to a festival or went to a concert, you had a, an extraordinarily good, uh, um, you know, uh, possibility of meeting your favorite artist. So if, like me, you went from being a fan to being the biographer of the, the women who were your heroines, um, Hotwire facilitated that for someone like me by putting me in the, the seat of journalist. Um, well, Bonnie, let me interrupt you for a second and say that, you know, one of my favorite top five probably quotes from women's culture of all time came from Sue Fink. Yes, who said, I was just going to say that. We don't have women's music. We have a women's music audience. And, and that I, really informed how we did Hotwire. 
I was going to quote Sue, and I have it on a little piece of paper here. I want you to see it says, Sue Fink audience, right at the top. <laughs> and I just quoted you in the book I'm writing now. That more than anything else allowed, I believe, the enormous range, uh, also in the Women's Music Plus um, uh, directory, which reminded us that, that this was the Journal of Music and Culture. So you had theater, radio, uh, the history of women artists during segregation, uh, the function of directors, uh, hosts, um, language. There was that whole uh, Suzanne uh, Ladin who did the um, language uh, uh, series. There was a lot on the uh, dance culture, comedy, uh, how you uh, became a producer, uh, sheet music, writing a score, becoming a composer, um, so something for everyone. So depending on your various interests, the audience for all of these things would reliably show up um, at different events. The last thing I want to say, um, because I know there's much more, uh, having learned how to be a better historian through working with Hotwire, uh, in 2017, I was actually able to get Hotwire into the Library of Congress. I did a, a timeline of women's music exhibit that lasted for 10 weeks in the Great Hall of the Jefferson Building and was seen by half a million people. It went up the week that Trump was inaugurated uh, and it led visitors from suffrage songs, which I learned about first through Hotwire, uh, ending with more uh, contemporary um, issues and so forth. And some of that I got from Olivia's, Olivia's archivist. But I positioned uh, the Hotwire in particular with Sherry on the cover because I wanted to pay homage to the incredible role of deaf culture and ASL in bringing women's music to everyone. And also someone I love. So I'll <laughs> pause. That's great. Thank you all again um, for joining us and being on this panel. Um, I feel like I know, I know the audience is gonna have a lot of questions or audience participants will have a lot of questions as well. Um, but just to start off from, with a couple questions, where, so if you wanted to buy Hotwire, where would you have found it? Where was it distributed to? Um, talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, there was an incredible network of feminist and independent bookstores at the time. So we approached every single one of them by snail mail basically, and asked them to carry it and arrange to do that. We had individual subscriptions and we went to women's music festivals and sold. Jen, do you have the picture of me and Lynn at National by any chance? Um, certainly the National Women's Music Festival, also um, Michigan Women's Music Festival. And um, if you can imagine, I know there's a lot of Chicago lesbians here in this audience, Mount Moving Coffee House had 40 shows a year, 40 Saturday nights a year. So we always had a hot wire table there. So there's Lynn and Scalchi and uh, Georgette's famous Audre Lorde issue as well. Yeah, so that was at National. Something um, I should have mentioned, if people want to see multiple speakers, if you go to gallery view, you can, you can see these images as well as the speaker. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, so those were really the primary ways. And part of uh, the volunteer crew every year, we had three giant, giant mailing parties that would take all day long. We'd start early in the morning with, you know, everybody's cars. We'd go to the printer, pick them all up, take them to some location, and then spend the rest of the day packing them up individually for subscribers. Oh, we had to staple in, as I said, our little record. We had to staple that in ourselves. So that was one of the work teams and then bag them up and box them up and then get them to the post office. It was really amazing uh, and so much fun. So much fun. Like Georgette said, the thing was really a celebration. We, to segue slightly off of the, you know, how we distributed them. Um, early on, before we ever published the first issue, we made an editorial decision that I am so grateful for. And that was that we would never print a negative review of anything. That our job was simply to present what women were doing and let the readers decide if they liked it or they didn't like it. So there was never anything negative. There was never anything that was really gossipy. So when we go back and read these things, they really were spirit lifting 
they, it never sowed any kind of a, a divisiveness. Um, so, and it was really fun to have uh, selling them at the booth at Michigan every year because we had Allison Bechtel sitting next to us always. That was our, our, our booth. Um, and women would come up at, from all over the country, sometimes internationally. And it was such an opportunity to, to network with everybody. Uh, it's just great. I, I feel bad for the women of today who do not have this whole festival subculture because, wow, it was amazing. That, that room, so one other question I wanted to ask. So if people, you know, you mentioned this, this, this culture isn't there anymore. If someone wanted to support women's music now, so if someone wanted to be involved, what are some of the ways they could do that or find out about these artists? And are there any festivals that they could still go to? Oh, sure. Bonnie, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, there are several festivals continuing. Uh, of course, we're in a peculiar lacuna of, um, you know, postponement. Uh, National was supposed to celebrate its 45th anniversary, yeah. July 4th, and uh, we're very frustrated, but it's going to roll over to next summer. That's going to be a big deal with a focus on the suffrage anniversary. The Ohio Lesbian Festival is as close to the feeling of, you know, real camping out and being wild as, as you have. It's terrific. Um, it was uh, just cracking last September um, with everything you would normally expect, a crafts area, workshops. Um, and they had an indoor air conditioned room for older women with puzzles and quilting, which was kind of cute. Um, and then there's uh, a whole lot of uh, conferences uh, that are now uh, focusing on the legacy of women's music. Um, there are also archives all over the country that are uh, collecting the material. Uh, you can certainly find most of the original artists uh, performing on Olivia Cruises. Um, and uh, the uh, work I've been doing in the Olivia archives has yielded a whole lot of back issues of Hotwire, um, negatives and photographs that uh, Tony sent. Um, just correspondence beyond, you know, a Snoop's wildest dreams, I must say. Yes. But there's also, um, I think, a, a, a return to interest as a lot of women are beginning to go through their own collections of posters and programs and photos. What should I do with this? And boy, I get like dozens of emails a week, which is fine. And people can write to me, what should I do with my stuff? And because I had, thanks to Tony's generosity, so many extra copies of particular issues of Hotwire, I used them in the classroom for 20 years and gave them to star students. And it was sort of like a trivia thing. If you can answer these questions correctly, then you can get a copy of Hotwire. And I can tell you, these college women were insane with appreciation and gratitude. They had no idea something like this existed. It was such a big deal. And that was the best uh, possible moment uh, to hand a piece of material culture and have to explain this is a song sheet. It's kind of like a 45. What's a 45? Yeah. So it also led to a conversation about before internet, what kind of technology and also the function of Hotwire as connecting isolated women, just like the yeah. ladies with their catalog. Uh, that you waited for in a quarterly way um, to realize the rich range of uh, producers and consumers out there who were just like you and who were also waiting to get something they could hold in their hands that contained a world. The Lady Slipper catalog was absolutely amazing. We love and, Lori. Yeah, Lori Fuchs. Wow. And all the women of Lady Slipper. Um, the, there's, at the 40th and final Michigan Festival, uh, a big thing that went on was the handing out ceremonially of acorns, encouraging everyone to go out and take this acorn and grow Michigan spirit somewhere, grow the Amazon fern spirit somewhere. So um, the MFR, Michigan Family Reunion started, and that happens. Um, that's another one, Bonnie, I think, you know, has really been somewhat yes, successful. Sorry. Um, and there's other smaller ones. There's one in the Ozarks still. There's a few. The big thing I would like to say is that, um, which is kind of entertaining, is uh, one of the women who turned out to be a founder of We Want the Land Coalition um, was sitting in the night stage bowl. And when the women came around, oh, sister, here's your acorn. She was like, 
what the fuck? And she threw it down on the ground. She's like, who, who even knows what that's about, right? So as it turns out, her acorn is in fact the land. And um, <laughs> Leslie Gallagher. And, and so at this point, um, We Want the Land Coalition is a very large coalition of women who have one thing and one thing only in common, and that's that they want this land to stay for women, for girls, forever. We might not agree about any other thing, but we agree about that. And so a contract was signed with Lisa um, to buy the land, and uh, events were held last summer for the first time. There were, I think, four weeks, five weeks of events. It was fantastic. They were small, but it was fabulous. Uh, there were going to be six weeks, but obviously, for safety's sake, it's been postponed till next year. But for sure, events are happening up there again. And it's a particularly thrilling uh, thing because the, the women's music core of those of us who were there at the beginning and ha are still here um, are aging out. Yeah. So this land is something that will outlive us. This land is the living, breathing, e ecological reality of what so many of us were striving for, which was to have things for women, for girls, forever. And in a time when, you know, the world is just being ruined ecologically, here's 650 pristine acres that we've gotten um, a conservation easement on, so no one can ever frack it, log it, develop it. Um, long after we're dead, it's there for women and girls forever. So look for those events next summer. Can I um, just jump in here? I think something I just want to make sure is mentioned is um, the workspaces that made Hotwire possible should be remembered and celebrated. Tony's basement in Chicago was sort of like a lesbian Disneyland ride. Uh, there were so many piles of uh, old issues and mysterious uh, raffle tickets and staples and covers and uh, negatives. Don't forget and the crank letters. The crank letters, you know, and I've had the the joy of going into the Lady Slipper warehouse recently mm. and, and having a similar kind of walk through the labyrinth of uh, what women did pretty much for no pay. And it must be said, this is also a history of women's labor, of the kind of commitment. And we all took it uh, into our living spaces. Um, I always had hot wire work and hot wire issues above my desk. I was very mindful of what Tony's workspace looked like. Even if I was in a different city, uh, writing to her, I could picture the basement. Um, I was also aware of uh, what the spaces looked like when we had the table at Michigan or elsewhere. Um, and I was always reminded when I volunteered at that table, please keep your shirt on, Bond, so that I mean, <laughs> yes. you feel comfortable coming up to the table. I was like, okay. <laughs> so um, the fact that so many women volunteered what was essentially their professional time for more than a decade, yep. and um, that we used the already limited, you know, spaces we lived in or whatever to uh, create something, um, and that that's not necessarily uh, counted in the gross national product uh, or in the uh, reconstruction of what lesbian living spaces look like if you wanted to create uh, you know, a home for some museum. Uh, a lot of women were running zines or um, similar uh, you know, entities out of part of their home. And um, those are spaces that are hard to clean out or pack up, but they were us. Right. Georgette, do you want to add anything? Well, I wanted to just point out how, how uh, making culture can really come out of very little to begin with that what we were what we were all doing really was creating an, a, a a sense of community for each other mm -hmm. and one of the amazing things tony is like a fabulous organizer and i remember her mind was always going on what to put in this magazine you know and so when i looked at them again i saw all the 
crossword puzzle, women's music crossword puzzles she came up with, all the contests, the, uh, the uh, audience appreciation awards, all of these things actually sprang from Tony's mind. Yeah. And, and so she was actually kind of like what she has done since in Florida, creating BLAST, this huge organization now of, uh, of women who do all sorts of activities with each other. Uh, that's uh, where I met my wife. <laughs> 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 but that if you have just a few very motivated, dedicated, focused people who are trying to do this kind of thing, uh, you really can create something very new. And uh, it was also a theme in the magazine itself. There were a lot of how-to articles, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the idea being, you can do this too if you want to. Do you really want to be a performer? You can. I did it. Here's how. You really want to learn about computers and, and music? I can show you where to go to learn things. You know, all, all of these sorts of things to encourage people to get involved and, uh, and um, start thinking more in terms of lesbian community. So it was great. You know, we, we touched on the uh, directory. And I'd like to talk a little more about that because if there was any one thing I could encourage young people today to do would be this. Jen, do you have the, uh, we shall go forth? I do, let me share the screen and I'm just gonna let remind people how to raise hands if people, ah. if people start having questions. Please, if you're, if you're on a computer, please click participants. And then at the bottom of the box, there'll be a, a space for raise hand. So then when we do open up questions, we'll be able to start doing that. <laughs> yeah, put that one away, Bon. We're going to get there. This is the first one that I did. And I want to say that I was going to the National Women's Music Festival. And um, it occurred to me that I wanted a role in women's music. I was 23 years old. I knew nothing. I'd had no journalism training, nothing. But I just had this gut feeling that this thing was going to be big and I wanted in on it so I thought you know well I'm not a good musician and you know who am I nobody at that point I'm a fan so I created this niche you can take that away Jen thanks um that's Margie Adam by the way uh I was allowed at that point to just get on the stage and take pictures however I wanted you know Lisa Vogel was also like 23 years old <laughs> what did we know um so I came up with this idea of networking people, women people. Um, that was the first one. I somewhat mo moved it to change the name from well, We Shall Go Forth to Women's Music Plus, which um, has, you can see on the bottom, the text, you can't read it all, obviously, because there's so much, but producers, radio shows, filmmakers, um, festivals, agents, uh, all the performers, everybody that I could possibly find. And so you can see this, it was this format. And this thing was uh, close to 80 pages. Everybody I could get to tell me anything. Now this is back in the days before computers. So this is Rolodex work. This is phone. This is no email, nothing, no social media nothing. This is me approaching woman after woman after woman and trying to persuade them to share what their precious resources so that we could all have it. So this is, it seems like an easy thing, but when you think about an independent performer who's really rely on, relying on her production network, for her to so generously give those contacts to other musicians who then might take her jobs, this is the epitome of the community spirit that we had. So um, I had this idea, you know, to find young women who seemed really talented and try to bring them together as much as possible. Um, there was a cartoonist that I really liked who was kind of fun. And I had her draw this custom logo for us, uh, which became really the Hotwire logo. It's a, oh, and a lot of things. Her name's Alison Bechtel. Um, she went on to do a few things. And every year with the directory, I approached another artist to adapt that 
drawing. And so we have several, I think Joan Hilty's one, this one's Ursula Roma. Um, that would be my, my big advice is for someone in their 20s to start doing this again because there are definitely lesbian musicians out there and with social media, YouTube, all these different ways of doing Facebook Live. And I think we're seeing in the pandemic, all the different ways that, that performers now can get in front of an audience. Um, wow, this whole thing could start up again. We mm -hmm. did it from nothing. Why mm -hmm. shouldn't women in their 20s start it up again for themselves? You know, And like Holly Near said, it's, it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's a different wheel. Yeah. But the methods of how you make wheels are the same. That's great. But we haven't really said much about the context of the times either. Um, Hot Wire uh, started in 84, ended in 94, and I looked it up, it wasn't until 1997 that Ellen DeGeneres came out on television, three years after Hot Wire was already gone. Mm -hmm. And in the articles, you do get a, a sense of, oh, well, what if you want to hold an event and nobody will rent a hall to lesbians? Mm -hmm. What if you want to, uh, you know, do all kinds of things? And, you know, that, that oppression was definitely real. Yeah. And, and the invisibility was quite overwhelming back in those mm -hmm. days. It really was. People were still arguing about whether is it a good thing to come out of the closet or not at this time, yeah. you know? Uh, so, um, so Hotwire was uh, kind of a beacon, especially for a, a lifeline in a way for some women who really had no, they didn't live in cities, they didn't know anything of that, they didn't even know that there were communities of women out there. Mm -hmm. yet you know but also uh we were able to cover two marches on washington 87 and uh 93 and yep. in one of the best things georgette i uh love that you did was um you wrote a beautiful article about the process of all of us uh singing on lynn thomas's anthem for the 93 Mar march on washington together proud and strong which was recorded in about six different cities uh, with different teams. Um, and um, the uh, process of actually making that song and, and that it was commissioned and then the um, preparation. And then we all sang on the steps of the Supreme Court or the Capitol, excuse me. Uh, and it became a calendar cover. I mean, there were like five different products going on there, but the whole process was addressed in uh, Hotwire. And then there was this group uh, photo of all of us on the back yeah. cover. Wow. The same issue that's in the Smithsonian yeah. uh, in the Library of Congress. And that was um, a wonderful, very thorough uh, piece that Georgette wrote um, where I talked and other people who had been in the recording process described what it was like for us uh, to be making something together. And again, no internet. Uh, we were in a barn, Lynn Thomas's barn, and on a different coast, uh, Sandra Washington phoned in and we played samples over the phone. And then we took the phone out to Lynn's car because it had a better stereo system than in the house. And that's how the different women in different parts of the United States shared the uh, putting together of one song. So if like me, you were not ordinarily in a band or in a recording studio, not only was that a chance to participate, it was to participate in the process of trying to secure lesbian rights, uh, go to a giant million people march. And then um, we uh, had quite a bit of homage to that in, in Hotwire, which, which we then handed out at the march. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, I think, a great example. And that was one of the last years. I mean, that was 93. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the uh, anthem debuted as a song sheet in the back of the magazine. So you could take it home and play it even if you didn't have the cassette. Uh, just great times. Bonnie, a BLAST member recently um, talked about that song and how she loved it and everything about it. And she actually had one of the t-shirts signed by Lynn Thomas. 
and I begged her for it, and she has given it to me for my art crimes. So that's excellent. We all signed. We did a thrilling. T-shirt. We all signed the back of it. You know, it was screened that way. And one of my memories of the march was being shoved up against somebody who was wearing our shirt, and I actually had my face in my own signature, and I was like, you know, <laughs> how did a little pipsqueak like me get to this point? And it's because something like our community and the Hotwire community enabled a whole lot of people to get a sense of their own, not only their own authority, but their own in, entitlement to participate in their own culture as an authority, right. you know? And the point you made about what was in uh, Women's Music Plus, I just looked at that fine print on the bottom, financial aid, grants, talk about sharing critical information for women who were rejected for their lesbian projects. Right, anything anyone knew. Tell us, we'll tell everyone. But believe you're, you're worthy. Believe your project is worthy. Believe you are worthy. Believe the culture is worthy. Believe that lesbianism is worthy. And work with other women. Yes. That was such a big part of it. Work with other women. Don't be out there by yourself. I think, I think we have our first couple questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it up. I, th I think our first question, I believe this is from Alex Dobkin. So, okay. Hey, Alex. Hi, Alex. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, one second. Can you show the picture of us at the march with Alex? Yes. Let me okay. Know. All right, Alex, you are unmuted. Hi. Great to see you all. Great to hear all these stories. I just love it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my title is Kathy Munzer because I'm sneaking in <laughs> under her authority. She's here too somewhere. Yeah, uh, but anyway, I just love hearing all your stories. I loved Hotwire. It was, um, it was such a, a, like you said, the audience, like Sue Fink said, we had the audience. Um, oh, there we are, look at us. There we are. Yeah. That's Yvonne Zipter in the middle. That's right. And me and you. Oh. And, and we were a whole world. That's the whole thing. We really were the audience, the participants, the performers, the producers, everything. Tech, the fun. techies. The techies from, from, you know, start to finish, up to down. We provided everything. And that was so empowering. Uh, and I love that, that Hotwire recorded, documented so much of the powerhouse yeah that we created. So thank mm -hmm. you all. You all are just awesome. I'm, I'm awed by all of you. And I love you all. Thank you, you, Alex. You. <laughs> all right, and then we've got, let's see, thanks, Alex. And we've got another question from Lori. Lori, I'm gonna unmute you. All right, go ahead, Lori. Okay, just expounding on what um, both Tony and Georgette and Bonnie have said and talking about that women's music was not a genre, but an audience. Um, women's music culture was a culture of participation and participants. And uh, here is how Lady Slipper, the idea was born. I was at the National Women's Music Festival in 77 and sitting in a workshop. And I, I think it might've been Dorothy Dean maybe was there talking about uh, Paid My Dues or My Sister's Song, or it was one of those really early journals. And people were going around the circle just saying, gee, I think I'll blah, blah. I think I'll start this. I think I'll start that. And I was just sitting there and said, oh, I know what I'll do. I start, you know, <laughs> a, mail, a collection of music by women, and, you know, for mail order. And at that festival, it was not only the audience uh, separate from the musicians, but there were so many round robins happening on the lawns. And so mm -hmm. it was just the communitarian feeling of that gathering that I think was so inspirational to so many people. And as a producer, I mean, you know, what did we have 200 production companies or more that would gather? Um, but the pr production companies would have been nothing without the lovers of the music 
who were the audience and so many of the audience was doing other things. And anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to the fact that that separation between audience and performers and participants in so many ways, there just wasn't that division that so many, mm -hmm. so many kinds of music represent. That's all. Thanks, Lori. And yeah, any, anyone who, who wants to speak, in addition to questions, please share your stories. Or if you had a copy of Hotwire, please share that um, with us. And I think, I think we have a question from, from Kathy Munzer now. So I will unmute Kathy. Producer of Mount, with Mountain Moving Coffee House for many years. Sorry, Kathy. It's not, the mute is not. I can do it. There we Second. go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, with Tony, producing with Tony for many years. And, um, you know, Tony, I just feel like you made the coffee house. Um, you know, we, we had outreach to a global market. We had mostly, you know, started out local performers, which was wonderful, Georgette right. and Sydney and, 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 you know, just there's so many local performers that were wonderful. But with, uh, you know, working at the festival, and then um, I've still got Women's Music Plus. I still have a We Shall Go For. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, everybody's, the performer's phone numbers and addresses were in here. It yeah. was goofy. I mean, right. it's a hold of anybody and everybody. And so yeah. Tony, you know, with these, uh, with these journals that she made, uh, you know, coffee, the coffee house really came into its own and we had a more diverse audience, more diverse performers. We had the top twins from New Zealand and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sue Fink, yay, Sue Fink came to the coffee house a lot. And, you know- Sue, hold up what you're holding there, Sue. Hold up what you got. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> well, you got the hot water, yay, 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 yay. Anyway, I'm so glad the hot wires are now in PDF form because really all I have are a couple of Women Music Plus and the one we shall go forth. And the hot wires, you know, through moving, they got stained and icky. And so it's just wonderful to have them. But Tony, you know, thank you so much for, I'm so glad you were in Chicago for such a long time because it really helped us. Bonnie, love you. And Georgette too. You know, you're all historians, great historians. And I really admire and respect you. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful community. It's a wonderful, wonderful community. I've always felt lucky to live in Chicago too. Together we did go far, and we're yeah. still going far. Yeah. We're not done. We're nope. still going. Exactly. I, um, one of the things I just wanted to mention is uh, probably my favorite initial assignment uh, was uh, interviewing um, Judith Castleberry's mother and uh, Deidre McCalla's mother for the article on mothers and daughters at festivals. And um, uh, I, you know, interviewed my mom too. And, you know, uh, because of Tony's closeness with her mother, that imperative to include our families in particular where there were really solid mother-daughter relationships and not to uh, buy into the, you know, generalized press that gays were rejected by their families or had no families, were anti-family. I felt like Hotwire did a great deal to present a, a pro family, if you will, vibe in terms of um, uh, really bringing in the other members of our households and that that was uh, what, what buoyed a whole lot of folks. Um, and the many times that Tony Sr.'s photograph showed up in Hotwire was such a treat uh, to readers. It made you, Tony Jr., more of a of a little girl who grew up person, which everyone could relate to or aspire to. Um, and I think it also allowed the parents in our lives who were positive about what we were doing to be excited to see their children in a magazine with a record in it, oi, you know? And um, that because I was very frustrated that Ms. Magazine was not covering festival culture. Magazines that were ostensibly feminist were not really taking it seriously. Um, and that sense of uh, being part of, of a, an ongoing project that everyone recognized was quality and that you could show your mom um, right. because you had other moms. And that was so important and it, it's just a tribute to the way you were raised. With well, there's nothing like an endorsement from a mother. Yeah. That's, that's the trump card, right? Yeah. 
Sue, you were going to say something. I see Sue, and I'm going to unmute Sue so you can show us the magazine. Sue, you are unmuted. Do you have your magazine there, Sue? Oh, can't hear you. Sorry. Her lips are moving, but. One sec. Okay, oh. great. There we go. Oh, wow. I mean, about three hours ago, two, three hours ago, I saw that this was going to happen. Um, and I went, oh, God, I've got to do this. I've got to see everybody. And I had no idea I'd get to see so many old friends. And, and uh, I'm pretty teary, actually. Um, this is like a little reunion for <laughs> me. And I'm sure for some of you, I mean, I'm looking at Lori and I just went, Wah. and I, I knew I'd see Tony, but on some of these faces that, that I'm seeing, it's just, um, well, yeah, I'm pretty teary. Um, I just I miss our community. I miss um, all that we have been. And I, I love the idea that we would, I see some young faces on these pages and uh, some big secret people who only want us to know their names. <laughs> um, um, but maybe there's hope that we can pass this on and, and it can and grow and to hear that this is uh, like Bonnie got this out, out in the world and it's in school and um, our community is, is, it's not just something that doesn't exist anymore. We, we still are a community and I'm just blown away and I just wanted to say hi to everybody and, and what an honor it is to see your faces and almost feel like we're holding hands or something. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But I just know so, do you have, I have the full collection. I just thought I there's Kay Gardner. Um, okay. and I mean I just have all of them over here. I have years of them just piled up right here. Do you have yours? Oh of course I do. Let's see <laughs> yours. Let's see it. Too embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> but I I do I do feel just Thank you, everybody, for just still hanging in here and, and knowing that we were all part of something really wonderful that's in all of our hearts still. For decades, we were. And we were so young. We were kids. Sue, it was just a fucking thrill to see you on America's Got Talent. Oh, a God. thrill. <laughs> well, it's also, Sue, you gave a very... Uh, terrific speech at the um, 1999 National Women's Music Festival. You gave a keynote that was so important where you talked about the first time you went into sisterhood books and you were uh, too afraid to uh, buy anything and you grabbed the Lavender Jane Loves Women album by Alex Dobkin. And then you wrapped up your speech by pointing out that everything that had been accomplished in lesbian culture, but that now uh, that bookstore was for sale because uh, boarders had moved in across the street. And mm. I thought in that speech, it took me a day to transcribe it. Um, I had it on tape and that's what I did earlier this week. You tied together how lesbian culture created a springboard for so much success and then um, some of the tinier institutes that we had created just for ourselves have been swallowed up by mainstreaming. And the issue of mainstreaming is something that Tony addressed in Hotwire uh, in a couple of issues uh, in a, a really terrific way. Um, do we wanna keep our successes just to ourselves? Would we like to be on national TV? Will we be put out of business by bigger groups that swallow us up. Those were discussions that did happen in the letters to the editor, which was such an important section, and in Tony's editorial. And made frankly, it about made it the tilt inevitability tilt. and and not so inevitability of mainstreaming. George, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to talk over you, but uh, your screen froze, so I didn't know you were still talking, sorry. It's not, in fact, it's still frozen. But uh, one of the articles I read in a fairly early uh, issue of Hotwire was one by Maida Tilchin, who was another contributor to the magazine, that talked about how um, a concert in a women's music concert in Boston was being produced by men, and the, the and the feeling was that our culture was being taken away 
from us and being sold back to us. And so that was definitely a, an issue that was discussed a lot, you know. You, you mentioned, so Sue, Sue just mentioned this idea of Hotwire still being in your hearts and still being something that continues to inform your life. Could you, could the, the three panelists, could you talk a little bit about how, how Hotwire and your work at Hotwire affects you today or what you're doing today? Whoever wants to go first. Tony made me what I am. <laughs> I am. I never, ever lose an opportunity in any public forum to express my love, honor, and gratitude for being pushed to be a better writer before I started trying to write a book about our culture. Um, and to ask different kinds of questions than I would have, to include different kinds of people than I would have, to accompany everything with better pictures than would have occurred to me, uh, and to always think in terms of uh, youth, uh, what was going on at the same time in pop culture, and other um, uh, reality checks. Um, and uh, anybody who had the opportunity to work with Tony has changed forever. Uh, no, it was not a one person thing, but it was one person's vision and commitment. And we yeah. all knew yeah. to respect the boss and love the boss. And boy, did I love the boss. So yeah, much of my well, life. I, ha I have to say, I love the love fest that's going on right now. But in fairness, <laughs> um, my, my thing was to surround myself with women that were smarter, better, more talented, more knowledgeable than myself. And if you go back and look at those mastheads, it's absolutely amazing who was involved and who went on to, to have fairly big names. Um, and they were all involved. Um, I, what I got out of it and what I'm continuing to reap the benefit of today is this idea that things are always so much bigger than you think they are. You just see something, but there's so many more people involved. There's so much more that can happen when women come together. And so some of the friends that I made are just lifelong friends and colleagues and, you know, co-activists. Um, I think it, Hotwire gave me the courage to move on after Hotwire to become involved in the brand new idea of a thing called GLSEN, which was the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Teachers Network. It evolved into Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, which is what it is today. But their mission statement was to end homophobia in the K through 12 schools. And I was a special ed teacher for 30 years in the public school system with no protections. So it was really hard being out and knowing you could get fired at any point. And I think had I not had 10 years of spoon feeding, the courage of all of these performers that were going mm -hmm. into places and things like Lady Slipper, where they're doing these catalogs and these distribution things with no money. Again, nobody had any money. We're all kids. Um, I wouldn't have had the courage to go on to address the take on the school system. And by the time I left, there were no gay straight alliances when I started. There were almost 50 gay straight alliances in Chicagoland by the time I was done with my work at Glisten. I think without those things under my belt, I wouldn't have had what it takes to, to come to Florida. Florida! Okay, have no contacts here at all. <laughs> Lynn Lavner, <laughs> Lynn Lavner, that's it. And Rusty Gordon. Um, and feel like I could not worry. I, even if there was nothing to plug into, I could make it happen. And I have, we have an organization called BLAST that I started by lesbian and straight together, women at the Palm Beaches. And we have over 3,900 members and we have over 200 lesbian events a year in Palm Beach County, Florida. And at this point, we're going to have way more than that because we have virtual online stuff constantly now during the quarantine. But um, I just, I feel like I got courage and I got encouragement and I am con was and constantly still humbled by all the women that are so much more talented and, and you know, better than me. So it's an honor to be a part of this and to bring my uh, you know, like they say about Tracy Bain, don't look her in the eye, it's going to cost you money. Don't look me in the eye, it's going to cost you volunteer time. 
<laughs> How about you, Georgette? Well, you know, I, uh, when I moved out of gay and lesbian journalism and I started working in advertising because at some point I actually needed to make some money, <laughs> um, uh, I kind of, uh, in the years since, have put a lot of that behind me, which is why it was such a pleasure to look at over all those old hot wires again. Um, but that time in my life definitely did give me courage and strength and uh, great energy from pretty much everybody I came into contact with who was in the community. And still now to this day, I mean, most of my best friends are people that I met um, when I was in the Chicago lesbian community. So. And it was so much fun. It and was. They were, fun. And you know, for those who feel thrilling. like, oh, they, what? It was thrilling. It was thrilling. Um, in the in this uh, gay press, gay power book, I was saying how to see the culture coalescing out of nothing. It yeah. was like seeing some primordial island come up out of the ocean to to you know have all these possibilities ahead of us to explore and to uh, be inspired by it it really was a thrill for me it was the yeah. lesbo knots that brought it <laughs> yeah <laughs> georgette made up the lesbo mania and the lesbo maniacs which is something that really yes. stuck. Oh, I would say another another yeah. legacy thing, another hot wire. Yeah, Tales from the Dyke Side, good yeah, one. So good. And let's go, um, yeah. Um, two things. Uh, the the hot title, Hot Wire, came from an erotic poem written by Yvonne Zipter. And Yvonne, it was great That's seeing right. you in A Secret Love in that movie, by the way. Um, and um, I have to laugh when younger women look at the generation of lesbians of, you know, boomers and Gen X who were the primary drivers behind the women's music movement. And they, they're like going to lecture us about being sex positive. Really? It's like, <laughs> you know, wow. <laughs> That's all I'll say about that. Wow. <laughs> it was fun. I have, I have one more question for you all, and then I, I, I think we've got one another question on, and then if anyone else wants to ask a question, please raise your hand to ask it. I was reading the first issue of Hotwire, and I saw there's a letter so from the editors, and there's tw a 12-point list of primary aims for the magazine and the intentions behind the magazine. Could you, could you talk about how much thought went into those aims how you came up with them. And for me, seeing that, it, it felt like such a good representation of a lot of the groups from the 70s and 80s, a lot of the women's groups, and how much thought went into every detail of the group running. Well, by 1984, we'd already been going to nine years of women's festivals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was one thing lesbian feminists are good at is processing. That's for sure. So, and, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's my opinion, that's a very good thing. Uh, people thought, of, women people thought about things and talked about things and hashed it out amongst themselves and then moved forward over and over and over and over and over again. And um, I don't remember what those 12 points were and I don't have that issue with me here to look at them, but you know, the principles were pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Georgette, do you remember anything about that? Um. Um, uh, more than one of those points emphasized prioritizing women, that uh, this was going to be focused on women specifically. So, uh, but yeah. Um, By for and about I, women. I do, intend to, I do intend to go read all those issues again now, so uh, it's right up there online, so. And let's see, so we've got um, Alex. Alex has a question. Alex Dobkin, I'm unmuting you. One second. There we go. Well, go I don't mean to hog more than my time, but I, I can't help but be, be struck by the similarities uh, between women's music of the 70s and 80s and 90s even, uh, and 
the experience of the folk culture of the 60s. It was a very supportive community. At first, for a few, you know, it was like three years of great community support where we shared songs and we supported each other. And it was a real community. We knew each other. We kept track of each other in some of the same ways. But what we did with women's music, we made something entirely new. I, I mean, the folk culture, there were some songwriters, but mostly it was traditional songs to start out and union songs and activist songs, you know, it's all related. But really we did something absolutely creatively new. Everything we did was new. That was something that I was confronted with when I first started writing and singing women's music about women. It was so, I knew whatever I did, it would be original. Yeah. It could, it could not be conventional because nobody had ever done it before. And that I think was a huge, it was a hugely powerful motivator for me and inspiration. Um, so that's one thing we did. We created an amazing world with every kind of person and <laughs> we are everyone. So thank you. Right. Alex, you, 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 you used to say um, all the time that um, people who say women's music is limiting are so wrong because where else are you going to meet women from other countries and learn all those other languages and be exposed to all these other kinds of things. Um, Sue, I want to say to you that one of the things that would have been new under the sun that I was just salivating for was for Angel City Corral to do Leaping Lesbians on America's Got Talent. <laughs> I was pulling for that one. So we still have that to look forward to, right? <laughs> All right, let's see, does anyone else have any questions or anything they want to share? Oh, I think I see someone raising their hand. River, I'm going to unmute you. One second, River. There we go. Go ahead, River. Hi. Hey, I'm in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I ran a women's bookstore for 18 yeah. years, Pandora Books for Open Minds. So I've seen a number of you in a number of contexts I sold books at Michigan Women's Music Festival and some of the nationals and um, so I was like the dispersal arm through Feminist Bookstore mm -hmm. Network um, selling Hot Wire, selling Lesbian Connection, uh, producing concerts, had Alex a few times. Um, just I'm so glad to see you all today. I think it was at the second Women's Music Festival in Michigan that Jill, who was a jeweler, she called herself Axe Maker to the Queen. Ah. I don't know if anybody remembers her last name. Sure, but Katie. Thank you. <laughs> um, Katie Van Durs. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, thanks. Um, it was raining and they had to stop the music because the tents were full of water. And um, she was out there yelling, we want the music, we want the music. And we were under the vendor's tent and people were yelling, Katie, tell them, tell them. And she said, she yelled and said, I'm not yelling for you, I'm yelling for me. You have to yell for yourself. And that stuck with me, you know. It stuck with me all this time. And um, then when I wasn't finding any women's culture in Kalamazoo, Michigan, I decided to make it. <laughs> and that's, you know, what you all have done too. Yeah. So, so I'm proud of us. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, River. All right, I don't, I think there's, there's no more questions right now. Um, I don't know if anyone else has something to say, please go ahead. I'll, I'll scan through just to see if anyone's waving on their screen. Uh, well, my lovely companion of the night was made by Carolyn Whitehorn in the 80s. I love her and cherish her. And that's one of the legacies also was sometimes having to go to events because I had to sell hot wire when I didn't want to go. And then something incredible would happen. Like I would meet somebody like Carolyn or, you know, something like that. Um, Bonnie, do you have Eden nearby? 
Uh, Can you yeah, sure. And talk about it a little. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in my uh, mom's living room, of course, she has my book. So, this is the book that uh, is pull it back a little bit. Pull it back a little. Thank you. Dedicated to Tony and Alex, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I originally wanted to do, do kind of a best of Hotwire, and Tony and I talked a little bit about could we do a volume that was sort of an energy, and she was very involved with Glisten, and I, I ended up writing it myself with all of its flaws, but um, I'm very proud of having done this first really large book. I feel like it's important also to credit uh, Laura Post, who wrote for Hotwire, really did uh, the first book. It was called Backstage Pass, and that came out a couple of years uh, before mine did. So there's actually quite a little bookshelf of stuff. But um, we, Tony generously gave me a, a whole range of photographs from Hotwire, and I expanded on some of the themes and techniques, um, which were interviews, oral history, uh, looking at different topics, controversies, and, you know, centered around Sue's great uh, sort of thesis of the women's music audience. Um, then um, I did a sequel, The Disappearing L, which is much more depressing, Where Are All Our Institutions Now? So now I'm working on a third called Recording a Movement about my journey as everybody's little biographer and becoming a person who kept everything, taped everything, wrote everything down, and uh, what prompted me even to do something like that. So thank you, Tony. <laughs> so um, much of the uh, trajectory I assigned myself, you know, I assigned myself homework the way Tony assigned me homework, uh, the way I grew up just because I was a kid who was successful with homework. Um, and the grown-up homework to really document our culture, get it into archives, get it into museums, make it understood to be as benevolent as it is, it's a very lonely process in piecing together, you know, now in quarantine or whatever, writing however many pages a day on volume three of this trilogy. But uh, Hotwire and Tony and Sue and Alex and Lori are all central uh, to what I'm working on now. I'm up to page 250, which is pretty good. And it re I'm revisiting speeches made at festivals about our culture, our publications, our community, um, and the off-the-cuff things that women said at the microphone, including some of Tony's great remarks uh, where you often return to that quote from Mary Poppins. Would you like to share that again now? Who are we doing this for? Not just us, but... Our daughters' daughters will adore us, and they'll sing in grateful chorus. Well done, Sister Suffragette. <laughs> well done. No, the hard thing when you're a historian is, is just as with the land, you know, you're not necessarily going to be around when the material handed down may have an impact on somebody right. else. But that's not a reason not to try. Most of the early suffragists did not live to vote. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I think we have one more question from Barbara. So Barbara, let me unmute you. And you are unmuted. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay, well, I just wanted to thank you all for doing this. It's just amazing and wonderful. From 1972, when I first heard Linda Shear in Chicago, <laughs> I was singing in a, in a free theater in Chicago, and we supported each other. But she sparked something, and I knew something else was happening. And I just um, wanted to say that. I loved being in Chicago, coming out in Chicago. But what happened and continued to happen, and is continuing to happen, um, the music is still there, and I'm grateful. I'd like to thank I would like to Jen. encourage everybody. I'd like. I'd like to encourage everybody to um, check out. Unfortunately, it was happening tonight, but it'll happen again in a month. Um, on a Wednesday night, Nia and Ness are hosting a virtual women's festival once a month online. 
NIA and NEST, if you're not familiar with them, are, in my opinion, like in the top three of uh, lesbian artists to watch. Mm -hmm. They're young, they're a couple, they identify as lesbian, and in a time when the pressure on them to identify as queer is, is simply unbelievable. African-American themes is lots of woven into what they do. Um, and I think that they're fantastic. And in all these years in women's music, I've never seen their act before. So check out Nia and Ness in general and see if you can hop on next, uh, next month to their virtual festival. Um, I wanted to put in a plug for a website called chicagogayhistory.com. Uh, it was uh, uh, set up by Tracy Bame and uh, it includes in-depth interviews with a lot of uh, the activists in Chicago in the 1980s, 90s. Uh, I know Tony's interviewed for that. I was interviewed. Yvonne might have been interviewed also, I, I would think. So, but anyway, there are a lot of- uh, Jane and lot Paula. Of, right, right, right. So a lot and, of and interest- And Tracy was- Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Tracy was very forward thinking because she understood that some of the ones who were pioneers were going to be passing away and she needed to get in there and get them not only yeah. interviewed in print form, but there's video of all of these incredible people and so many of them are now gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, Tracy, if you're watching, that was one of your just better ideas and would love to be able to get in there to update it, by the way. One of many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, Tony, can you, just, can you share with the some of the other countries where you had subscribers? Because that always impressed me. Oh, everywhere. Um, Australia, Europe, uh, South America, not Antarctica. Um, one of the one of the entertaining things that happened was at the 1987 March on Washington, where you know you saw Alex, Yvonne, and I. We had those hot wire signs, and we had a hot wire contingent. Oh, it was so exciting, and this young black man came running up to us with a heavy Af African ac uh, accent. And he was saying, oh, Hotwire, Hotwire, that great women's magazine from America. And we're looking at each other like, who is this guy? And he, go he was a foreign exchange student in a house that was a Hotwire subscriber and it was his favorite American magazine. <laughs> and it was hilarious, like, wow, we're reaching our target audience, you know, young men who live in Africa. So <laughs> it was very widespread and um, there were uh, many things like Mignon uh, Lee Warden in Australia, who, interesting character, she grew up in South Africa. Uh, her dad, when he was young and Nelson Mandela was young, they were anti-apartheid workers together. And as you know, the black guys got rounded up and put in jail and um, her father was elected to be a representative of black townships. And so this was the, the home that she grew up in. So when she moved as a young adult to Australia, her goal was to make festivals that would bring together white feminists and the Aboriginal women of the stolen generation. And the stuff that we provided, she has credited many times with being the foundation of her being able to actually do that. And um, she's continued to perform and do festivals all these years later. I mean, you know, it's amazing. That's just one that I know of because she told me. Who knows how much other things happened out there. Um, so. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do one more plug and just say that if anyone can wants to sign up for the Gerber Hart newsletter, you can go to gerberhart.org. Yeah. We're gonna keep having more virtual events and then hopefully whenever we reopen, um, we've got some great exhibits coming up. Uh, we have our exhibit, the Lavender Women and Killer Dykes exhibit from about lesbians and feminism in the 70s and 80s, uh, co-sponsored by the Chicago Women's History Center. That will be up for a while and we'll, we'll hopefully do a live tour whenever we can go back into the space when shelter in place is lifted. Uh, but please join our newsletter and then follow us online. We have Instagram and Facebook at Gerber Hart. Um, so we'll go ahead and end the panel here. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank yeah. you, everybody. It was fun. Good to see you all.